Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rask AgeNet webinar two. My name is Peter Charlton, and I'm a researcher in the European cost action Rask AgeNet. Rask AgeNet is a network of researchers from Europe, the US, and Australia who are working together to refine, harmonize, and promote the use of vascular aging measures in order to improve clinical practice and reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease globally. Before we get started, I would like to run over a few housekeeping points. Firstly, your microphone should be muted. If not, please mute it now. Secondly, we will pause at the halfway point for questions of understanding, and then there will be an extended opportunity to ask questions on both the material presented and the wider topic after the presentation. To ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. This webinar has been live streamed on YouTube and will be recorded and shared on our website and on YouTube following the webinar. You will only be identified as attending this webinar if you ask a question. Finally, we will not be able to assist with any technical difficulties throughout the webinar. It is my great pleasure to host this webinar and to introduce our speaker, Kuhn Reznik. Kuhn originally trained in electrical engineering and has been active in biomedical research for over 20 years. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. His work includes research into the elastic properties of arteries, ventricular vascular interaction, and cardiovascular adaptation. His work has applications in the field of cardiovascular disease, particularly in hypertension and diabetes. His current research line, constitutive and system characteristics of large arteries, is focused on unraveling the multi-scale structure function relations that underlie the pathophysiology of accelerated arterial stiffening. Today, Kuhn will be speaking to us on basic vascular mechanics. Kuhn, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. I'll now hand over to you. Well, thanks, Pete. It's a real pleasure to do this webinar with you. So uh, many thanks for the invitation. Um, so let's go on to my first slide a bit of an introduction to those who don't know me yet. Um, I'm Kuhn Reisink and uh, assistant professor is said at Karem School for Cardiovascular Diseases at Cardiovascular Research Institute Maastricht. It's one of the largest uh, uh, cardiovascular research institutes in Europe. Uh, I'm also affiliated at the same time with the Maastricht University Medical Center and especially the Heart and Vascular Center. Before I get into my lecture, uh, I'd like to point out these notes. Um, first of all, my lecture will be uh, having some repetition of definitions, which were in the first webinar, as presented by Stefan Laurent. Um, the definitions might differ a bit, so if you have questions about that, we will address them. Also, a bit of a disclaimer, um, I'm citing most mostly recent papers uh, and a lot of my own papers so i'm not doing more well, proper justice um, as you as one should in papers but anyway i think this works well enough um, and i think it's good to know for you that the contents are sourced from educational lectures i'm regularly giving and ongoing work the focus will be uh, really on large central arterial structure and function and the structure of this presentation of the lecture is first we go into basics and then I follow that up by application to interpret data. Um, that also means that halfway we have a bit of time for questions to um, round up the first basics part. And um, please note uh, the slide numbers if there are any uh, unclarities or questions that arise, um, then it's easier for us to tackle them. Well, the first question I wanted to start with is um, how is arterial structure determined? And I've coined some um, words uh, that are used in literature um, which cover this, uh, this part. Um, it's development and adaptation and growth and remodeling. And um, so you will hear these. 
Well, it all starts with this. Um, during our development, uh, or of any mammal actually, uh, there's a need for perfusion. So there's a, a, a clump of cells that needs, has a metabolic demand, uh, and there's a need for perfusion. Um, that means that some agent, in this case blood, um, will have to flow from one A to B and back. Um, and that creates the circumstance that there are mechanical stresses um, around the cells. Um, so during development, those stresses, uh, mechanical stresses, I'll get into details later, they're sensed by um, the structures um, that become vessels. Um, so the local homeostasis, st homeostatic rules, um, they, they sense these stresses, so that's the vessels locally doing that, and then structural adaptation comes from that, and that'll give uh, a vessel um, a certain function in the circulation. And one of the uh, um, differences we regularly uh, make, uh, discriminations we make regularly, is between macrocirculation and microcirculation. Well, it's on large vessels, but I, I like this video a lot. This is microcirculation. So you see shadows of blood cells flowing um, and you, you, know, you can see perfusion going on actually. Um, so this is just to offset this picture with later pictures of larger arteries. I think I run this one again. So you see shadows and you see the dynamics of flow there. And these are really small vessels in someone's or upper lip. So this is the vascular bed. Um, in the uh, middle there are the smaller um, vessels and capillaries um, and on both sides left and right you see the large uh, vessels in the body uh, and now we're talking at about these arteries. You, on below you see the cross-section of these arteries and you can clearly see there are differences in um, diameter and in relative wall thickness um, and these ensue, um, you know, these have grown via the rules I'm going to discuss with you. So from this overview, uh, let's get back into this scheme again, because it also um, teaches us uh, a bit about what happens when there is dysfunction. So when something goes wrong, um, very often, it means also that there is a, um, a backward or a feedback to the mechanical stresses as shown here by the red arrow and the, um, the, the yellow thing here. So the essence is that with this function, it's progressive, it's a loop. Um, and this is not normal physiology, this is pathophysiology going into vessel dysfunction. So I'll be using this concept as well to talk about um, basic mechanics. Let's look at the um, structure of the vessel. So this is just a vessel, an exa example to look at the uh, more detailed structure. So on the left side, you see the discrimination of the layers of the vessel, which is intima, which is the in internal layer. Uh, it's the lining of the vessel um, against which the blood flows. Then the media, it's in the middle. Um, it consists of lamellae, so several layers. Um, that have a similar structure, and the adventitia, which is the outer layer, which consists of um, um, tissue like collagen. On the right side, um, I've pointed out the composition, the main components of the intima, which is glycocalyx and endothelial cells, of the media, that's smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts to some extent, and extracellular matrix, the ground substance, elastin and collagen, I'll get back to these uh, components later. Um, and the adventitia um, mostly consists of collagen. It's like a, a kind of a, a safety net for um, excessive distension. And um, some vessels have vasa vasorum, which means vessels of the vessels, and they kind of act to perfuse the wall uh, where it's needed. And the, uh, think about the coronary uh, artery system on the heart, it's just like that. Well, structure is di um, determined by two stresses, main stresses actually. Um, so one is diameter. 
um, then we should talk about wall shear stress. So this is where I try to define it for you. So wall shear stress often um, is um, abbreviated with uh, tau. It's the viscosity of the blood, uh, eta, times the shear rate. And the shear rate is the derivative of blood flow velocity to the radius, as shown here. So you see here that the, the shear rate is largest um, close to the wall. That's, that makes total sense because at the wall, of course, the actual friction uh, occurs. And in the middle of the vessel, the least friction is felt. Um, so therefore, the highest velocity is in the center of the vessel. So on top, I put there diameter is determined by a rule. And the rule is keep wall shear stress constant and can actually tell from looking at the process of vascular growth um, that if there is an increase in perfusion or perfusion, so V blood increases, then the vessel will respond uh, with an increase in R with radius. And if that's um, um, in line with the increase in velocity, then uh, wall shear stress will be kept constant. So it's, of course, the mechanism is much more um, tricky than that, but the rule is quite simple, simply explained by this. So let's look at the, um, the actual actors in this regulation. Um, so this is showing you um, um, in a moment, a, man, um, um, a scheme how flow mediated dilation works. Um, and I think it's also uh, the basis of the diameter adaptation long term. So if you look here, um, there is a vessel, and this is about the round cross section. This is the long axis in this direction. And here you see a blood flow pattern. Um, so what will happen if I click um, just now? It's quick, and actually in real life, it is quick. So if there is an increased flow, um, there will be an increased flow velocity um, shown by larger arrows, um, creating an increase in friction at the endothelial uh, interface. And that will stimulate the endothelium uh, cells, uh, EC, to, um, to secrete nitric oxide and other compounds. And that will lead to a dilatation of the smooth muscle cells, SMC, of the wall. And by that mechanism, the vessel wall or actually the vessel will distend so become have a larger inner diameter um, which brings back the wall shear stress to the normal value so this is where it goes increase in flow stimulation of endothelium no relaxation and dilatation so this process actually works when you're starting to exercise with you know one of your limbs um, then the supplying arteries will do this um, it's not so easy to measure uh, brachial flow meter dilation is a very well-known measure of that so if you're uh, looking into that this is the mechanism and long term um, this is also the first step that occurs um, i would like to make this critical point um, usually flow meter dilation measurements are uh, regarded as endothelial, as an endothelial function biomarker. And if it's um, decreased, then mostly people talk about this is endothelial dysfunction. Well, as I just explained, there is a lot going on here. So it might not be only the endothelium, but also smooth muscle cells and surely the matrix of the vessel uh, should also be considered. So I leave that to you to think about that. And the other stress, which is really important, is wall stress. And um, wall thickness is kind of determined by the rule to keep wall stress constant. Well, let's look at this scheme here. This is a cross section of a vessel with a pressure inside the vessel. Um, it's assuming the pressure outside is zero. It's a transmural pressure. Um, and with wall, the vessel has a wall thickness H and a radius R. I'll use these definitions later on as well. Wall stress then is um, given by this formula, which is known as the Lame equation. And that's actually the Laplace law for a tube structure. 
Um, a good in illustration of, um, let's say, normal physiology or wall thickness adaptation is within hypertension. Um, when you look at measurements uh, from patients, you know, people that have hypertension, so an increase in P, you will find very often an increase in H. Um, very often that's called damage to the wall, um, but I think the wall, the wall is actually responding quite well. So that's also a discussion point. Um, so if H increases because it's below the division line, line it will offset uh, the increase in wall stress uh, by the pressure. So this is normal regulation. Uh, a very obvious or well-known um, other pathology is aneurysm. Um, and in that case, there's an increase uh, in the radius of the vessel. Um, and if, if all is constant, that means that the wall stress is increased. And well, it's, it makes sense. Um, the problem of an aneurysm is that it might rupture or dissect. Um, and that's clearly related to wall stresses, um, excessive wall stresses going beyond the strength of the wall. So apparently in aneurysms, um, this regulation um, is not going well. So summarizing this a bit, um, structure is determined by wall stress and wall shear stress homeostasis. And here you see this full picture again. So this is um, just to think about um, these vessels um, and how they look like. They arose from the hemodynamics. And because of the local rules, they got these shapes and these properties. Um, in the red bar uh, are shown the stress values or actually tension values from these vessels. And I think this has been known for quite a while. You see uh, the references to uh, Thomas and also Rothbard, I think, wrote a, a very nice article um, about how the vessel um, do, vessels do this or achieve this. So that brings me to the second question of the first part is how are blood pressure and arterial properties related? Um, and I wanted to coin this um, saying that compliance is not the same as distensibility and both are not the same as stiffness and their pulse wave velocity or wave velocity is not the same. So either it's the way you measure or assess stiffness and um, there's multiple physical definitions that um, are used. And I think it's really important if you work with these that you know how to discriminate them. So I'll add my bit to that. Um, and I'll later on um, tell you where you can read further. So let's first start with this overview. Um, so the, the function of the large arteries is compliance we're discussing here. And um, if we look at the top part, the A part, you see that um, the pressure pulsations in the arterial system, when blood comes from the heart, they are there. Um, and the difference between the maximum and minimum systolic and diastolic blood pressure, that's what we call pulse pressure, PP. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I want you to do a bit of um, interactive things. So here is my wrist. Um, and between this tendon, so hold your wrist or your arm likewise. Um, this is a tendon and here is a hard bone. Um, most people can find it quite easily. And then put your, um, your two digits right between them. So actually where X marks the spot or a little bit there. And you might be, so don't press too hard. And well, I'm quite sure you could feel your pulsations. Otherwise you would be lying on the carpet. So I think that's a good illustration that uh, of compliance is the fact that pressure pulsations are palpable. If the vessel weren't compliant, uh, then you would not be able to feel it. And this is actually also the basis that doctors used and even the ancient Chinese people, doctors, um, to actually assess cardiovascular function. All right, let's get back into thinking and looking at this stuff. Um, let's first look at the epidemiology of pulse pressure or let's say age-related hypertension, as I call it. Um, there's a good paper by Smolian about this, which is cited at the bottom. 
Uh, basically, it comes down to this, um, that if you have systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure plotted against age, um, then it, it has this pattern. Um, basically, it shows that below 60, um, this is in a, let's say, normal population, so not with certain types of hypertension, so kidney, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's all out of this uh, analysis. Then you see that pulse pressure, the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure, is quite the same. Um, and from age 60 onwards, um, pulse pressure um, is increasing to like two times or even three times at age 80 or 90. So how does this work or what's the yeah how does this work well let's look at this um, animation here on the left side you see the left ventricle where the stroke volume sv is inside of it and on the right side you see the large artery system and where we will look at pressure in blue and um, it's also important to to you know to be aware of that at the end of the large arteries of course this is a model version it's not anatomically correct there is the microcirculation. So when the stroke volume gets through the valve and into the large artery system, you see that actually it starts off right here when the valve, actually at this point, when the valve opens, then the stroke volume gets into the large arteries and the pressure increases from diastolic blood pressure to systolic blood pressure. That's where you get the pulse pressure from. Well, what happens if these large arteries become more stiff? They will distend less. And then uh, we get an increase in pulse pressure. That's what we just showed from the epidemiological slide. Well, um, if this would go on, then um, elderly people would have a very low diastolic blood pressure. Um, and that doesn't happen. Um, clearly, from epidemiology, you can see other things happen as well. And that's, um, they have changes also in the microcirculation, uh, which increase uh, resistance. And of course, the kidney and um, the venin angiotensin system, they undergo changes as well related to aging. So that brings back this or lifts up this curve a bit more. So elderly people have a quite a normal diastolic blood pressure, perhaps a bit lower, but will have uh, still an increased pulse pressure, meaning that systolic blood pressure will definitely be increased. And um, the consequences of this is that the left ventricular mass will have to increase. The heart is also highly adaptive to this. So for a long time, uh, people will just go on living. Um, but uh, in the end, it's related to um, adverse outcomes of hypertension. So this is clearly only systolic hypertension I've discussed which is very directly related to large artery function. Just to show you a bit of this, so this is from some current work we're doing. So this is the proximal aorta um, here on the upper, in the upper corner, you see the fat pad of the heart uh, right there. So the valve is about at that position and you see the heart or you see some pumping action. That's what, uh, what you can see. The, Let's do this again. Um, the dissension of the uh, aorta is not so evident from the video itself, but it's, uh, you can see it on the right side where the markers are traced. Yeah, so every, this is another cycle, and this is another cycle. So just to give you a, a bit more feeling for what it, what it does. So let's get on to the definition of compliance. Um, and how it's done for arteries. So on the right top, you see C is delta V over delta P. So that's the definition of compliance. So volume changes with respect to pressure changes. Um, and for a vessel, it's very hard to look at volume. And actually, given the fact that length of uh, vessels mostly does not change, we can look at the area, delta A uh, divided by delta P. So this is what people call the area compliance. So on the bottom, it's defined. So compliance, area compliance is delta A over delta P um, and, does, and does distensibility um, from area is defined as delta A over diastolic area 
divided by delta p. Let's look at the vessel a bit. Um, so here you see the diastolic condition or diameter or area and the systolic. So clearly there's a distension ongoing and the difference between those is the uh, delta A, um, which um, results from the change in pressure, delta P. Well, the property of this vessel, um, elastic property of this vessel is distensibility. This, this is the way you could measure it. There are multiple ways to measure it, but this is uh, by far the most, um, well, a direct one. Um, let's see, I think the distinction between compliance and distensibility, that's the point here, is that compliance says how, what the buffer capacity of the vessel is. So how much volume can the vessel take with a given change in pressure? And distensibility is really not looking at the vessel like that. It's looking at the uh, elastic property of the wall. Basically it's saying how much the material is stretched for a given change in pressure. So to make that a little bit more uh, tangible, hopefully, um, there is this um, problem. So um, we have two vessels uh, having the same distensibility. So the material of the wall is set or assumed to be the same or behaving the same. Then uh, with a certain delta P change in pressure, um, the area will change to a greater extent in A, in one, then in two, and I've exemplified this or amplified this by looking at these gray areas, which correspond to the, um, the areas in the uh, rings. Well, if you then do the math a bit, uh, let's say um, the, the effect is three times larger in one than in two, um, then it would look like this. So given that it's the same distensibility, uh, in this case, uh, it's calculated as uh, 47, uh, per megapascal, then um, the delta A would be 1.5 for one uh, um, and the um, diastolic area six. And that will give you the same number as this ratio because it's basically the same uh, fraction. Um, it means that uh, the compliance that's not taking into account the diastolic area, that will show the difference. So conclusion here, is compliance is different in this case where distensibility is the same. So this is, well, as clearly, uh, I guess, an illustration of that both properties are not the same. Um, there is some literature which actually defines compliance as distensibility. I think that's fair, but it might confuse you. So that's why I put it in here. I think with aging, uh, I've just discussed, but um, the, the relationship is this. So a decrease in the sensibility, so a stiffening of the wall material um, will lead to, um, in the end, uh, a decrease in compliance. Um, but uh, as I shown in the epidemiological slide, um, the real effect uh, becomes only noticeable after 60, age 60. This video, I think it's uh, uh, also a nice um, illustration to make it a bit more tangible of what else happens in the arteries. Um, so here in the far back of this video, you will see uh, an LVAD, which is a left ventricular assist device. So it's a blood pump with a valve and it'll pump blood, uh, sorry, it's not blood, it's water into this bicycle tube. And uh, the length of this tube is about two meters. Um, and what you will see is a wave propagating from the LVAD um, towards you. Um, and you'll, you'll also see uh, some uh, reflections and the wave propagates with a pulse wave velocity of about 11 meters per second. And that would be a pulse wave velocity of somebody of 70, 80 years old. So here it goes. Okay, so the theory behind it is this. Um, this bit I got directly from uh, snapshots of hemodynamics. Uh, the citation is on the end of this uh, lecture. Um, so what is it saying? Well, that's con um, the theory considers a infinitely long uniform tube. So the 
properties are all the same along its length. The length is infinite. Uh, and then it considers um, the properties at some position of the R tree. Well, this says basically that if um, a volume is put into the R tree, volume changes, as we've just discussed, then the excess volume will create a wave and the wave front will move in that direction because here the volume is put in and the velocity of the wave is C. That's called wave velocity. And wave velocity is here locally um, related to um, compliance and some other stuff. And I'll point that out to you right now. So first of all, uh, it's important that D um, is the diameter in this case. Um, the area obviously is then assume that it's a round structure. It's pi times the radius squared. And the radius, of course, is half the diameter. And this vessel wall also have a thickness h and a, a property uh, e, e ink. I'll just not put e ink there. Um, and that's the Young's elastic modulus. Um, rho, as put there, is the density of blood. And then we have kind of defined uh, everything here. So wave velocity is um, you know, given here. And I think both, are, um, both uh, formulations are equivalent, but these have been done by uh, Newton and Young or Frank or Bremwell Hill equation, very often quoted. Uh, and this is the moons korteweg equation. Um, it's really important to actually note the assumptions. I think the most important ones um, are that the viscosity of blood um, is negligible here, is uh, negligible. So that's the viscosity. That's not the same as the density. Um, the other one is that H, it's thin walled. So H must be much, much smaller than the diameter or the radius. And uh, um, the third assumption is that E applies. So it, it also means that the material behaves linearly uh, elastic. And what does that mean? Well, I can show you on top here. It kind of means that if your pressure changes like this, so it's a triangular wave, with a diastolic and systolic pressure. So this is delta P. Um, then what you will get is a concurrent change. Sorry for that. My drawing skills are still improving. It is a concurrent change in the diameter or area. So the troughs happen at the same time and the peak happen at the same time and the waveform is exactly the same as for pressure. That's kind of what linear elastic means. So this is theory. Um, and well, at this point, I'd like to point out uh, an excellent recent paper by Patrick Seegers in, uh, in ATFVB uh, on how to measure this arterial stiffness. And uh, clearly also in uh, webinar three, Rosa Maria will go into how to measure it. So these concepts will also be uh, covered there. So I think we're kind of halfway. Um, so uh, we would like to invite you to ask some questions. So Peter, any questions from the chat? Thank you, Kuhn. Um, thank you very much for a helpful and accessible overview. Um, as mentioned, if you have any questions, please do insert them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, I, several of my questions relate to the wider topic, and I was interested in the, the rules that you give for the diameter and the thickness of arteries um, and the implications for clinical practice. But I think um, we'd like to save the broader topic questions till later on. Um, 
Yeah, that's good. And uh, also the, the second part of this uh, lecture will actually um, do a bit of that. So go into that as well. Fantastic. Given that the, there are no pressing questions of understanding so far, um, in the interest of time, could I suggest that we move on to the second part and then we'll be delighted to take further questions at the end? Yep, sure. Is there one coming up or? I think they're, they're now getting, people are typing them. So I might, we might get quickly uh, do them. So if you can read them, Peter. So, um, firstly, would increased viscosity of blood increase arterial stiffness? Uh, ooh. Well, the, the, the stiffness concept is, um, is related to the assumptions. So um, I cannot say yes immediately. Um, no, it's actually difficult to, to look at that because of the definition itself. Um, I think the viscosity of, well, clearly the viscosity of uh, the blood itself will endow, let's say, um, the arteries with a resistive term. So you have a loss of energy um, that makes the propagation of the wave or the, the mechanics of the wall quite complex. So actually you get a mixture of both. Um, there's a lot more to say about uh, velocity and wave velocity. Uh, one thing is that, for instance, wave velocity in uh, veins is um, about the same um, magnitude as the, the flow velocity. In that case, the wave velocity which you will observe uh, while you're measuring it will be flow velocity plus wave velocity. That's different from arteries where the flow velocity is much smaller than wave velocity. So there it's also the sum of both, um, but the, way, the flow velocity itself will have less of an impact on its value. But that's quite detailed for this purpose. But hopefully at this point, this is a, as good as an answer as I can give. Thank you. And um, we have other questions on uh, which of the properties such as compliance, distensibility, we should look at in clinical practice, how we take these measurements, um, which we could address now or after your second part. Yeah, I think second part, yes. Uh, I think quick answer right now is that, um, while there's a lot of practical um, issues, but also practical or pragmatic um, um, issues in choosing what to measure and when to measure. So it's also what I'm not really covering here, uh, but I think after the second part, it's uh, easier to discuss that. Thank you. And just a final question of understanding. Um, how would wall stress and deformation be affected by the local curvature of a vessel? Um, well, thinking if cur curvature is in the circumferential plane or transverse plane, um, actually that's also the topic of the next part. Um, so we can, I can only answer that when you're actually looking at what happens into the wall or in the wall. Um, and it's also important to note that um, we are using assumptions that say that the wall is homogeneous um, and mostly uh, linear around um, its operating point. Of course, that's not true. So we're really working with approximations that seem to be giving us some insight into the data, um, but we know the real vessel is much more complex as I already showed a bit. So with that, I would like to continue in the second part. Thank you. Okay, so we go on. So the question I'm addressing here is how does aging change basic arterial mechanics? Um, and um, I think it's important to note here that uh, it's what I'm presenting is highly simplified, though because it's based on key findings and assumptions, um, I think it will do good justice to um, the understanding of basic vascular mechanics. So in this reviews, um, we've looked at the various factors going on. And I think these were looking at clinical papers, uh, especially. So clearly a lot of studies are focused on risk factors. Um, and I've put here 
the main ones, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, and hypertension. So these system level um, disease um, processes um, or yeah, factors, they have an in influence on the processes that define the tissue of the vessel. And I've named here a few. So degradation, calcification on top, um, turnover and glycation. Um, there's synthesis, contractility and proliferation if we're talking about vascular smooth muscle cells. We'll talk about that um, a bit later as well. And surely the process of adaptation, which I've just discussed. Um, this all creates the circumstances for a vessel to form its structure uh, with these major components shown here, elastin, collagen, and smooth muscle cells. Um, and from that, you will get the, um, the function, so the distensibility and pulse wave velocity. So um, this graph on the bottom, it's not easy to, um, to discuss it with this page, um, but we'll do that in the next. So the basic mechanics of the arterial wall, um, I thought could be summarized by these. So here's your cross section of an artery again, um, with um, wall thickness H, radius R, transmural pressure P, um, wall stress. So that's the force um, holding together the wall um, per unit of area where these walls touch. So that that's makes it uh, a stress or a pressure as well. So it's the same unit as P. And um, an elastic modulus, uh, Young's modulus E. I've used the simplest um, icons for this. Um, so here on the right side, you see the Laplace law or Lamey's equation as well. So sigma is P times R over H. And actually um, derived from that, um, is the formulation on the bottom, uh, right bottom, E is 1 over D times R over H. And mind, D is not diameter here, and I'll do the derivation uh, for you right now. So E, the elastic modulus or Young's modulus of the uh, wall, is defined as the change in wall stress with respect to the change in wall strain with strain, given that it's a circular structure, that's the change in radius um, referred to or with respect to the um, actual radius. Very often this is chosen to be the diastolic radius. Sorry for that. So when we look at our equation then here, sigma is P times R over H. Um, then we can write it like this. So here comes a D, here comes a D as well. Here comes a D. So it's the pressure ter perturbation of the Lemay's equation and then the, taking this definition. Um, and then we can substitute um, E in here as well. Actually, this should have been delta epsilon. Um, and so we can write this one as R dp r over h and here is um, dr well uh, the d as i told you is here defined as dr over r times dp which is um, not the area distensibility but it's the diameter or radius distensibility so radius distensibility. And um, if you look back on the first slide on compliance and distensibility, then you'll see the similarity between those. Um, so this one is substituted by 1 over d because it's the reciprocal of that. And then you get into exactly this equation there. So a bit of math for who's interested, but um, it's I think it's important to know that these um, E comes from um, sigma in this way, the derivation. So let's go on to this part. I think this is also a, a crucial slide 
showing um, my thinking, but also of no knowledge about aging. And one of the hallmarks of aging is really is a degradation of collagen as um, illustrated above um, or on top here. So when we're young, elastin um, in these uh, separate lamellae in the media, they form continuous layers uh, with that. With old age, um, the elastin appears fragmented and uh, discontinuous. And this has um, a, a great effect on the mechanics of the wall. Let's look at this um, graph here pressure on the y-axis and cross-sectional area, but you could also read diameter. It's not the same, but diameter um, or radius. I mean, the relative changes will be um, the same. Um, let's consider the elastin structure uh, for a let's say, long, young vessel or normal vessel, um, and that will endow the vessel with uh, the pressure area relationship as shown by the blue dash line. And in the vessel present is also collagen, as uh, previously discussed, and it will endow the vessel with a pressure area relationship uh, shown by the red dashed line. Uh, what's really important to note is that the red dashed line only starts here. So only at a certain distension or deformation of the vessel wall, uh, collagen gets into um, into contributing to the um, uh, stiffness of the vessel. That's often referred to as recruitment. So these collagen fibers are recruited at a larger, at a certain area, uh, but not at lower pressures or distensions here. So if we take both, um, this is the, you know about the simplest model you can make of a foreign artery, then the black line shows you the, um, the integrated response. So what happens now with aging, or less than degradation actually, that's the simplest model for aging I'm using here, is that um, the elastin structure has a less stiff, yes, less stiff um, uh, property. So the line goes down. So do, let's do that again. So this is normal. And with the degradation, actually the elastin structure starts to become less stiff within the wall, which means that for a certain pressure range, um, the load bearing will shift from elastin to collagen structure. And in vivo, when we measure it, we actually see this. We don't see the components. Um, we, um, we see only <laughs> part of um, the relationship because there's, or in vivo, there's a certain systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So let's assume for this, in this case, that that, that does really doesn't change. And this one could do or is actually doing also in linear regression analysis. So here you see um, for young it's a less steep curve and steepness is stiffness in this case. For old you see a steeper curve but you also see a shift rightward in terms of um, dimensions or radius. So that's from this is that with aging um, you have an increase in radius as well as a, a decrease in distensibility and I don't think it's good to think about um, any of those being compensatory for one another I mean this mechanics model says it's two resultant um, changes that happen because of the same process a less than degradation um, the next step from this is, is that I assume and I think it's a fair assumption, but still, we could discuss that. That wall stress, if it increases, um, this will also increase this effect. So the elastin degradation is um, somewhat related to wall stress being present, but of course it's also modulated by biochemical factors and biological factors. But I think here it's, um, I assume that if wall stress um, is increased, then this aging effect is exaggerated. And of course, that's the, um, rationale between uh, administering antihypertensive um, agents to patients. So we'll look at that in a minute. So let's go back to this um, framework we're building. So here again, the Lamey equation and Young's modulus formulation, and I'm adding to this this bit. So now I'm looking at um, the 
the dynamics of aging as um, driven by elastin degradation and modulated by wall stress. And basically, so these are inputs, uh, two inputs, and the output is uh, distensibility and radius. So before we go into looking at data, just um, a slide on how these can or are measured. In this case, I'm just focusing on uh, ultrasound techniques because the, the study data I will present later um, actually did this. Um, so IMT can be measured um, as shown here from this graph as the distance between the intima uh, lumen echo and the media adventitia echo um, sh as shown here. So wall thickness H can be um, estimated from the intima media thickness from an echo uh, recording. Diameter is uh, the adventitia adventitia diameter, which is the outer diameter. And of course, half of it is the radius. Um, and I'm using here as well, the definition for distensibility. So distensibility uh, previously in oh, introduced to you. So these can come from well, pressure measurements and from ultrasound measurements. So this is what's been used um, in the CATOT uh, study. Um, that's a study by uh, Rosa Maria Bruno and her group uh, in Italy back then. Uh, this is an outpatient cohort where, uh, from a hypertension clinic. Um, and we've looked at the number of uh, patients, um, looked at a three to four years follow-up uh, with treatment as usual. So anything happens actually. Um, and also we discriminated three groups. Um, stratified, we stratified the, the population to uh, the diastolic blood pressure change at follow-up um, into decrease, same or increase. And we used a individual specific significance level that is twice the measurement error. So it means that anybody who had a, di a diastolic blood pressure decrease of larger than seven uh, millimeters of mercury um, is a decreaser. <laughs> um, if it's above or the if there's an increase above uh, that amount, seven millimeters of mercury, it's an increase and in between it's the same. Well, please note what I'm showing here uh, or will be showing is observed changes over time. So these are all deltas. So where it says P, R, H, et cetera, these are all deltas. These are differences at follow-up with respect to baseline. So when we look at the constant or the same blood pressure uh, group, um, obviously then P is not significantly different. It's only uh, a very small amount. We see an increase in radius um, of um, 0.34, uh, 39, sorry. Um, and no significant change in age. Um, that means if you calculated an increase um, in um, sigma, but it wasn't significant here, um, an increase in one over D, and actually that's, that's stiffness, it's one over this sensibility. Um, that's significant and E goes along with it as well. So these things um, are come out markedly from this analysis. So it says that if blood pressure doesn't change, there's an ongoing uh, progressive stiffening, um, especially and, and uh, clearly an increase in radius. So let's go back to our framework to analyze it. So apparently this happens, um, a decrease in D, in the sensibility and uh, an increase in R, which will lead to an increase in stiffness. So Young's modulus of the wall. It also means if um, R increases, that on the top, you see that if R increases, sigma will increase. And then actually what we have here is a progressive aging cycle. Um, it's driving itself. So if it's true that sigma uh, wall stress is uh, um, a modulator, but driving further or accelerated um, uh, decrease in distensibility and increase in radius, then this will go on and go on. I think it's at this one, well, this, this is an illustration, I think within this framework of a progressive aging cycle. So what could help 
getting out of this? A number of things. One is H. It's below the division line. And as I showed in earlier in the first part, um, if it increases, it would offset um, the stiffening. So that's shown here. If H increases with the green arrows, um, then it has this effect. So it will decrease it, the wall stress by the wall thickening. And by that also decrease the increase in stiffness of the wall. Can we see that in the data? Um, yes, I do think we could. Um, so these are the numbers for the decreased uh, group. So let's first look at age in this group. And I think it's related, but there is no proof of that yet. Um, there's an increase in age, significant increase. Um, and we see a decrease in, in sigma and wall stress. Of course, in patients, everything happens at once. So we, it's very hard to discriminate. The other thing happening here, obviously, because of treatment, um, blood pressure, uh, diastolic blood pressure was lower, but you can, uh, that's assuring the blood pressure will be lower. So that's the other reason why um, sigma is decreased. Um, interestingly, what we saw in this, um, this group was that stiffness um, did no longer increase with the follow-up. So that's good, good news. Uh, Antihypertensive, they actually halt the progressive aging cycle. Um, but unfortunately, it's not regression of the aging cycle. So it's not making more compliant vessel, in this, way, in this case, the carotid, or less stiff. Um, but it does stop this process. Um, well, the second part, of course, uh, what I showed is the decrease in blood pressure. So if P um, is brought down, uh, then that will uh, lead to this decrease in wall stress and also lead to the decrease in the elastic modulus. So the pressure um, decrease is actually against this progressive aging cycle. So that's, again, the rationale for the treatment that these people uh, get. Let's look at one more thing. Um, I think it is good to note here that still for um, the case where we have halted uh, stiffening, uh, we still have a, an increase in radius. The other thing I wanted to add here is what happens if pressure increases. So these people were seen after a while again uh, for you know, clinical reasons. And they were not mistreated, but their blood pressure um, rose. And for this, uh, in this group, we saw, well, a clear, uh, by definition, a clear increase in blood pressure. Uh, the radius increase was um, also larger than those observed for the other two groups. So this is also significant with respect to the other two. Um, there was no uh, change in wall thickness. Uh, clearly, there was a increase in wall stress. That's what you expect if you consider these uh, relationships here. And with that, uh, a clear increase in stiffness as uh, identified by one over distensibility and uh, elastic modulus. So it's twice the effect of the constant blood pressure. Well, I think this is, um, well, let's say not a proof of the framework, but it does um, help to see how things are related. And I'll come to that uh, in my conclusion slide. So this is all looking at uh, the vessel. Um, so I guess that's as basic as vascular mechanics can go. But I think it's important, and it's also where my research is currently taking me, is to understand that um, cells are doing this. So back to cells, they built the vessel. It's really interesting how that happened. They maintain it. But what if? So we'll be talking about uh, mechanobiology and biomechanics, but only briefly. So back to this slide again, showing you, um, let's say, what I consider the main actors, smooth muscle cells, and elastin in arterial aging. So elastin discussed that a lot. Now a little bit more on smooth muscle cells. Um, this is a drawing I made myself when reading uh, this paper um, cited at the bottom, Clark, I think it's an excellent paper. Uh, it's a lot of reading, 
it's not a long paper, it's a very detailed paper. It's the first paper that I learned um, that actually um, reports the fact that the elastin lamina, um, as you see here, um, consists of a sandwich construction. So there is a sandwich here. So there's two, uh, so that's, that's one lamina and there's a second lamina here but the lamina itself is a sandwich of elastin lamina, laminae with collagen in between. And I think the, uh, the data in this paper is quite compelling and I don't think that a lot of people have gone into this as, um, yet. So in the middle there is a, well, my version of a smooth muscle cell with a cytoskeleton and contractile units in it um, and focal adhesions as noted here. And I think, uh, well, in my mind, the, uh, the linkage of the smooth muscle cell is kind of like this. It's attached to elastin. I mean, please recall that the elastin and collagen, they are put there by smooth muscle cells uh, with a different phenotype. Um, and they are arranged, smooth muscle cells, mostly or predominantly in the circumferential direction, as are the um, collagen fibers. And I think uh, Patrick Lacolay in 2017 published a, a real comprehensive overview of smooth or muscle cell um, biology and physiology in the context of arterial stiffening. So it's really recommended reading for you. Um, so back to our framework uh, that we built in this lecture. Um, let's take these two equations again. Let's do a bit of algebra. It's not that difficult, I hope. Um, Actually, I'm here taking P to the other side, which means that we get sigma divided by P. And here, same thing happens. I take D to the other side, and you have E times D. They both equate um, to R over H, which means that then if you equate both um, formulations, you get either sigma divided by P is E times D, um, or this version. And I think, I mean, this is mathematical. It's, um, it's fully consistent. It, it says like one is one. Um, even the units of, uh, of these, um, of these, mar uh, these, of these properties are the same. They're all in Pascal. So they're all stresses in a way. Um, but that's not what I think is the, uh, use of this formulation. I think it's because this gets us thinking about tissue level things that happen. So wall stress to some extent is dealt with or felt by the tissue itself. And the tissue property is the Young's elastic modulus. Well, that really translates, that's what the equals um, says in my view, it translates to what happens uh, with pressure and distensibility at vessel level. So to me, it's kind of a reminder of the multi-scale uh, structure function relationships that matter in arterial aging. So this is my light sli last slide on this topic. Um, uh, I put here a bit of links there, uh, linking me mechanobiology and biomechanics. Um, one notion that's in the literature is that wall stress regulation, as I have reported or uh, introduced to you, um, it seems to be somewhere at tissue level that this is um, something like a stiffness homeostasis. So vessel, um, smooth muscle cells, they tend to um, keep the stiffness of the matrix around them um, the same. I think that's worthwhile considering. Um, also, the wall is organized in structural units, um, even radially and circumferentially. I think that's uh, a cue or uh, some information which tells us what the uh, the rules are or how cells uh, do this. Smooth muscle cells, they can sense changes in stress. Um, I would almost say like there is multiple sensors. So that's unfortunate, which means that it's unfortunate in the sense that if you study one pathway, there will be another pathway, maybe even at a different level, uh, which might get into it in the way of understanding or planning experiments. So I think we should consider it and still work really hard on understanding that. It's a definite challenge. Um, and the other thing is 
there are sensors, but there are also um, actuators. They can respond to changes in stress and smooth muscle cells, they do that by changing contract, uh, contraction or contract contractility. They might reorient or synthesize matrix or migrate or pro proliferate. A lot of literature in biology has been spent on this. Um, and I think historically, most of the contractile behaviors has been studied in smaller vessels. And I, th I think it's time that um, for larger vessels, we start looking at it. Um, on the bottom, I think some excellent uh, reading uh, for you to go into this. So I would like to wrap up. So my summary of this um, lecture is uh, with its key learnings and discussion that arteries were built by cells in response to changes in mechanical and hemodynamic loading and aging with its hallmark elastin degradation increased the stiffness and outer diameter and i've noted here uh, well let's say my personal reminder of what happens in the wall matters uh, when you measure uh, or trying to assess aging uh, by measuring vessel wall properties or vessel properties and i would like to put forward some discussion points I think wall thickness clearly cannot be a stiffness marker. In some papers it is used like that or discussed like that. I think the present data has shown shows that it cannot be used as a stiffness marker. Um, and the other thing is that to assess aging stiffness, um, at, for instance, one over D or positive velocity, it needs to be considered in relation to geometry. Otherwise, we might not entirely see what's happening. Uh, I have not discussed it, um, the pressure dependency of uh, measuring uh, wave velocity and stiffness, um, but it's clearly there. Um, just this might slide, the citation of snapshots of hemodynamics, and I think the contents of this lecture are, uh, are uh, well dealt with in these chapters uh, for more thorough reading, but I think it's also an excellent introduction, especially if you're foreign or new to the field. So chapters 9, 11, and 21, well recommended. And with that, I would like to conclude and uh, go into our questions and answers. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any further questions, please do add them to the Q&A box and uh, we'll address the questions asked so far. Um, Kuhn, thank you. Firstly, we have a question about taking measurements in animals and wondered if it might be possible to take these measurements using echo. Yeah, I think with the um, regular high frequency or high resolution ultrasound machines, I think visual sonics, uh, Fuji uh, have systems around. Uh, I think it's, well, yeah, I know we have a system ourselves. It's possible to look at the larger arteries and actually uh, look at distension waveforms uh, with ultrasound, uh, much like the uh, ultrasound slide I just showed. Um, IMT, that's more difficult. That's, I think, still beyond resolution there. Um, so distensibility you can get. Uh, of course, for distensibility also pressure needs to be known. So experimentally you have to think about um, having at the same time um, readings of blood pressure and systolic and diastolic blood pressure, which will probably um, need or require cannulation because um, under the, the uh, if you do these measurements, the animals will be anesthetized um, on general anesthesiology, um, and um, mostly then the uh, tail cuff measurements are not reliable, at least in our hands. So I hope that answers this question. Thank you. Um, secondly, if one has the objective of lowering blood pressure. Which property should one measure? Compliance, distensibility, pulse wave velocity, or maybe something else? Well, <clears throat> there are multiple reasons to lower blood pressure. Um, clearly, uh, blood pressure is lowered by looking at, uh, by the experts, so, so the clinicians that look at multiple factors, so risk factors, etc., etc. So the the measures um, you mentioned are all measures that have a relationship to the large artery uh, part of 
hypertension. So I think any of those would do. Um, and I think the, the most important thing is actually, you can also see that in, in the literature we've, or the publications we've, we've um, been doing from um, say 2015 on, uh, the pressure dependency is really important to consider. And I think uh, uh, Bart Sprong, uh, for instance, he has done uh, some great work of really getting to the bottom of that and actually looking at how you could apply pressure dependency um, adjustments or corrections on existing measures or on existing data even. So I think uh, pressure dependency is the one thing you should first look at. Thank you. Yeah, very helpful pointer. Um, we've got a question about the carotid artery and in particular the longitudinal movement of the artery. So what is the source of longitudinal movement? And secondly, could your bicycle tire tube setup model this? Yeah, well, the, um, well, the bicycle tire clearly is not a good model of an artery. Um, and I'm saying that because uh, there's quite some literature um, around looking at the biaxial mechanics of vessels. Uh, we're doing uh, our studies uh, experimentally also uh, looking at uh, those properties. Um, Jay Humphrey's lab from Yale University is really well renowned about that. So I think reading, um, reading in that area is really important. And actually that says that um, in vivo, under normal circumstances, um, vessels do not actually um, deform in the longitudinal direction. So actual uh, deformation is quite minimal. That's how the arteries develop or set themselves up. It's very tricky or intricate to, uh, to talk about that um, or to actually explain fully. So I think I'll leave it at that, but length really doesn't change. If you see an artery moving on an ultrasound image, uh, that's rigid body movement. So it's not deformation. It's not the lengthening uh, with the pulse that happens. Um, and I know there are quite some accounts of strain, longitudinal strain happening in those uh, artery walls. Uh, but very often uh, there is an issue with uh, resolution or tracking the speckle pattern. So sometimes um, well, let's say people get that wrong and they the images they're looking at and the analysis they do, they leave the impression of, uh, of strain or the uh, diameter, but actually the physical basis of the tracking of the distension is not, uh, is not really there. Um, but clearly both comments are no proof for that it couldn't exist. And clearly with tortuous vessels or actually vessels that undergo uh, uh, significant pathology like aneurysms or otherwise, um, uh, lengthening and also longitudinal strain will happen. Thank you. And just briefly, a final question in the interest of time. Um, does collagen change with age? Uh, yes. Um, collagen is, has a turnover of about, I think, two to four, uh, to four weeks. So actually the structure is reinvented or uh, laid down uh, again and again. And also collagen itself without cells um, will uh, remodel over time. So, um, but the renewal, I think, um, well, can go both ways. It's it's not, it, it has a different role than elastin. So I think that's fair in, a, in my very simplistic model of elastin only changing um, that's built on this notion. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for giving up your time to present to us and uh, thank you all for attending and participating. We'll be hosting future webinars every month until the end of the year and we're delighted that Dr. Rosa Maria Bruno will present our next webinar at the same time on Wednesday the 8th of July on the topic of how can I measure vascular aging and who benefits most from the measurements of vascular aging. We look forward to welcoming you then. From Kuhn and I, goodbye and see you next month.